purpose of what we do for Cloud State, it's really to help educate what's going on in the marketplace. Every year we bring panel discussions in, or speakers, I'm sorry. Uh, and this year we've got some absolutely phenomenal world-class speakers with us. Uh, so what I want to say with this is we, we will be showing shortly here, sort of our format. It'll be interactive, so please, uh, I don't know if we have a, a mic for the audience, or is it just stand up and speak? Yeah. Okay, so if you have a question related to what the topic is, please feel free to just put your hand up and stand up and uh, but the one thing is an hour and a half goes very quickly, so I'm not going to start counting an hour and a half until we start getting on here. Uh, so basically we'll show you the format, but first of all we want to do is just like introduce our, our uh, speakers and panel uh, speakers here. So uh, Russ Rosanskis, who works with us down on the south, will bring on the people that you speak with, and then I'll take it back. Here you go, Russ. Thanks, Gary. I want to reiterate a big welcome for everybody attending here. I really want to thank the sponsors. We've all seen the Gary and Vitron Center. I want to thank them very much for helping to make this very possible. So, um, last year we had a great lineup. This year our lineup is even better offensively than last year, but it's going to be really good. So, on that note, I want to introduce our first uh, panel guest, Doug Walker. He's the technical director for Mr. Lisa. I've had the privilege of working with Doug at Dow Corning for a number of years. And Doug started at Dow Corning in 1980, and he helped launch the two-part 982 program that Dow Corning has successfully had for, for many, many years. Uh, in 2002, and I'm going to skip a little bit of time, a lot of time uh, Doug retired from Dow Corning and worked for Maine National. Uh, he hired me also for a little bit. I've been following Doug around, and from there he went to one of the he's the technical director of North America. So Doug, I'd like to really welcome Doug Walker. All right, also uh, another former colleague of mine, uh, Lawrence Carberry, we call him Larry Carburetor. And again, another 1980s guy. He joined Dow Corning in 1982. Uh, Larry's led a pretty good life in the construction industry. His contributions are second to none. He's wrote about 2 million uh, ASTA papers, only 30, right? And um, I'm not going to beat up too much on Larry, but uh, Larry, thanks for coming up. We greatly appreciate his busy time schedule. I just also want to know that if you want to know anything about brewing beer, he is the beer meister, ladies and gentlemen, Larry Thomas. Hi, Russ. And two others here. So Steve Thomas, who's joined us often in the past, uh, we've asked him to come back because I really feel that the technical aspect of a lot of the products we're doing now, uh, the jumbo capability of, uh, of low e coated products that are coming out and so forth, are really getting more and more difficult. So we want to make sure that we've got a well-rounded group. Uh, so Steve Thomas is a Western North American technical advisor for Guardian Glass. Has approximately 12 years of experience in the glass industry, including engineering involvement in a variety of unique, high-profile projects. Steve has contributed to the Commercial Fenestration Systems Manual in development by the Glass Association of North America, as well as ASTM E1300, standard practice for determining load resistance of glass and buildings. He's available anytime as a resource on a wide range of subjects related to glass and glazing. So we'll be handing out his phone number at the end of this. Uh, have the one up, Steve. And lastly, but certainly not least, is uh, James Chang. Uh, Jim and I have go back about oh, 15, 20 years now on various projects, and it's been wonderful watching him develop the city into a world-class uh, appearance. So it's, uh, it's an honor to have James here. Uh, James Chang is a Canadian architect recognized for his pioneering contributions to the West Coast architecture and city building. Born in Hong Kong and educated in North America, Chang's approach represents a sensitive marriage of generous open environments with vibrant, high-density living. He's a lecturer at the University of British Columbia and a design critic and juror. Chang launched his architectural career working for Fred Bassetti at Mythen Partners while earning his Bachelor of Architecture degree from the University of Washington, Seattle. A condominium project he designed during this time captured the attention of Architectural Record Magazine, Young Architects 1972 and Record House 74, and garnered awards from AIA Seattle as well as National AIA Homes for Better Building, for Better Living, I'm sorry. 
Cheng went on to apprentice with Henrik Bull in San Francisco and then three years with Arthur Erickson in Vancouver before studying at the Harvard Graduate School of Design under Richard Meyer. Cheng assembled with James, James Cheng Architects in 78 after winning a collaborative entry from Ramses Kwan and Associates to build the Chinese Cultural Center in Vancouver. Since its inception, the firm has been uh, pre pre presently focused on designing high density urban environments around nuanced open spaces that foster social interchange. Cheng plays a leading role in a widely studied and emulated form of urban development known as Vancouverism. The firm continues to evolve concepts of livability and sustainability. Uh, Jim, I'd like to welcome you up to the stage, please. Thank you. So just before we get started on this, I do have one question because I'm sure others do here. What would you call Vancouverism? <laughs> yeah, um, well, Vancouverism is something different to everybody. And I think the common thing that I think people, most people would agree is an attitude about living in Vancouver and how we address the mountains, the waterfront, and the open spaces in between. I don't think it's a style, it is more a set of attitudes about how we like our city and how we like to live. Wonderful, thank you. Okay, so what we're gonna do is, as I say, 90 minutes goes very quickly. It's 10 after now, um, I've got, I'll be watching the clock. So what we've done is sat with these gentlemen and a, a group of people here at Garibaldi, we, we looked and said, what are the issues that we, that we come up with in, uh, in Mark all the time? Uh, what are the questions we get asked? So what we want to do is just sort of breeze through, because that's honestly, we could spend an hour and a half on every one of these, these topics easily. So uh, if anybody has any questions along the way, please feel free to just put your hand up and let's get the interaction going right away. But we are going to time each and see just how we get through. If we don't do that, we'll get stuck on one for the duration. So what we've done is called the project life cycle. So I think where we want to start off is get Jim's opinion on architect, vision, and design. Uh, he does, does projects throughout Western and North America and other areas. So with right now, the concept for Glass Day this year is challenges and trends. And we are seeing things getting crazier, let's call it. So Jim, where do you see the market going uh, now into the next five to 10 years in terms of design? And what, what will be required? I, I was afraid you're going to ask me that question um, because glass is probably the most complicated topic one could have as a designer because if we look at all the methods of construction, glass is the one that changes the most, you know, in terms of technology. I mean, we started out with small panes of glass that people can make to single pane, to double glaze, to triple glaze. We started with flat piece of glass, now we can curve them, we could bend them. So really, if you look at other construction methods like stone or brick or wood, there's a limit to, inherent limit to what that material can do. But glass, we are learning, is totally changing. And is always responding to the energy requirement. So for now, we're learning that triple glazed glass, we could actually improve the performance of passive house. We could actually put more window area into that kind of system. And with the technology that they are developing, we could have two hour fire rated glass that we could now open up all the underground parking lobbies with glass. Um, we have structural glass that Apple, that people have pioneered. They can do all kinds of things. So when you look at glass used by Frank Gehry in Paris or other, place, other people, it's, it's almost no limit. So as designers, we're constantly struggling to say what can we do with glass? Um, and then of course, with tinting and shading, with energy performance, different parts of the world require different responses. So if we're working in Southern California, it's very different than working with glass in Vancouver. And if we're in Saudi Arabia or Dubai, it's So, so just to be clear on that, so what are those differences that you see in those different areas? What, what's causing the concern? Many things, to also building type. If you're working in an office building, it's very different than working in residential, uh, so on. No, for, for example, residential, if you live in Vancouver, people like big pieces of glass because they want to look at the view, they want to look at the ocean. So if you can give me a 10 foot wide piece of glass, I love it, right? But if you're working in an office building, you're stuck with five foot grids. And I have a hard time convincing the client that, hey, Carrie said I can do 10 foot. And then, of course, the clients said, whoa, 
at 500 feet up in the air, a 10 by 10 or 10 by 14 foot of glass and thousands of pounds. So logistically, how do you get it up? And, and how do you actually efficiently install them? Uh, then with the triple glazing, there's also issues of wind vibration. You know, when you get up to a thousand feet, the wind hitting the glass has creates a different resonance. So as architects, we have not only have to deal with visual quality of the glass, but technical quality of the glass. And also, when you have triple glaze, how much space between glass, and how and whether under severe stress, the glass will actually touch itself, right? And then with more faces, there's more low coating we can apply. So like our project in Hawaii, it's actually a, a curve in both directions. But we actually managed using computer to do all the glass that's rectangles. And we actually have to work with a specialist to figure out how much that glass plane can warp the torrent so that we could actually use it to form compound curves. So all of these are new technologies that open up the computer and allow designers to think out of the box and try to do new things. So, so what I'm hearing from you, Jim, it's not, it's not a fear of where it can go, it's how we get there. So Absolutely no fear. Yeah, yeah, exactly. But as long as I have these people, they help me. Well, and that's just it. You know, I, I, I mean, it, you guys have a mic, and I think we might have to have one shared here. Do you have one? Okay. So you guys feel free to jump in any time, but the things you bring up are why we get some of the new equipment we have to. The question now becomes, has it been tested? We're now designing before we even have a lifespan of some of these products. So those are, those run fear through my point because you're getting some people like art. Well, those are fears of our part as architects because I'm sure a lot of you know the famous IMP building in Boston, the Hancock Tower with glass panes that are falling off. You know, because in those days we don't have computer and wind tunnel testing, the shape of the buildings create a negative suction force that acts like an airplane brake, right? So when we try new form, new technology, there are inherent risks. And we have to now find out who we could work with to protect us and the owner. Right, John Hancock was lucky that they're their own insurance company, they can insure themselves, but it could bankrupt <laughs> a lot of owners. Right, okay. So looking at those designs, you know, what we're talking about is a lot of complexity perhaps, but the complexity just makes the last generation uh, more commoditized, it might be. So perhaps we can give some idea, you know, we were talking a lot last night, Larry, uh, where you see, with a lot of these designs, where, where's that line cross between what, what, what was complex now commoditized, in my view, a little bit? Where's, where's complexity headed? What are, what are our concerns? Well, I think that over the past 35 years, we've been really successful in the adhesive attachment of this glass. And, and that because we've got great uh, air and water infiltration performance, uh, thermal barrier, and we have the ability to keep the uh, keep the noise out because there's not any gaps in the system. And that was, that fear of adhesive attachment was really what drove a lot of codes and standards 30 years ago with how we do this. And it's a lot of the quality control that, that you do today. Well, that has become commoditized, especially when you have the third world coming in go, oh, well they glue glass in North America, we can do that too. And, and they go through the same learning curve and, and some just uh, disasters. Well, after having some more of those disasters, that should have never happened because the quality control wasn't there. But, but there's an example of the, the high technology of one day becoming uh, commoditized. Now where we're at because we're getting so comfortable with the adhesive attachment on these facades of glass, we're starting to do things like cold bending. We're going to what is cold bending? We're going to take a flat piece of glass glued to a flat frame, and we're going to put it onto the facade. And in one corner, we're going to take it back 50 or 60 or 80 or 100 millimeters, and and this effect is very very dynamic over 20 or 30 floors. And and I can see this, and 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 you don't necessarily want to pay for hot net glass, and because it and it can be relatively easily done, but that puts additional stresses on these adhesives. Now, if I'm going to take hot bent glass and try and do some things, that further puts the stresses. So, 
the next step will be further understanding and analysis of the distresses that are going on in the adhesive, in the anchors, in the aluminum framing system, and the glass, and then because it's going to be insulating glass, the durability of that insulating glass. So it's going to keep getting more complex, but it's going to take more uh, additional understanding, testing, and modeling, and validation to, to prove that out so that James can get what he wants. Okay, that's an excellent segue, actually, because I, I am trying to keep on a timeline here. <clears throat> and we put the next box up, which is a design assist. But that really speaks to where you were headed there. So Doug, whether it's yourself or whoever wants to jump in, I think Garibaldi spends a, a, an awful lot of time willingly, wantingly, to be able to be part of the design assist. That was our header last year, and I think it's a topic that uh, is used, but it seems to be used in much more monumental projects, where if it was more in the mainframe, uh, there's so much that go, goes on, it's impossible for you and your team to understand the products that are available, why to be used, cold bed. It's easy to say, let's just pull it, leave it. Oh, longevity, and the whole food chain that it, that's involved in uh, the manufacture of the products. So as design assist, to, what is it wise to come in? How can we best assist Jim live his dream so that we can make uh, make it viable? Because we often run into, Jim may have a design, the last thing you want to do is change that design up and show it to an owner because it's not going to be physically possible. So when is that line there for design assist and, and, and how do you suggest we make that more prevalent in the market? That's a good question. I think uh, from our standpoint, we like to, uh, not like to, but I think we actually function more as a design engineering firm um, than construction. I mean, that's uh, my counterpart here, Alex, uh, actually heads up that function for the West. So he can keep me honest if I say something I shouldn't. But in any event, uh, the earlier, the better that we can get involved because we're a global company, we have a resource, but even local regional companies, you know, all of you, any of you there in the Glazer, you have some experience with some of these materials. It may be limited. Uh, focus in a given area, but if we get the team together as early as possible, we can say, okay, yeah, we've had that history. In Larry's example, Colt Ben, we worked together with Dow Corning to do one of the first projects in the U.S., and we all thought about everything that we think we could think about, but we forgot to think about the PIB, and it was great, and we said, well, what are we doing to the PIB? So I guess the message is the devil is in the details. So you get everybody together and contribute to knowledge and not be afraid to be very open and honest about, we've tested this, no we haven't. Uh, there, is no, there is no scare, but if we don't know, you know, get us into a mock-up as soon as possible, you know, to test each of those materials and try to pull the knowledge. Pay now or pay later. Well, pull the knowledge. Yeah, I just like to add one more thing to that. I, I think it's so complicated now, we need so many specialists. You know, for that project in Hawaii, we have pushed the glass, co-bending, but what we didn't know is the coefficient of expansion of the aluminum behind the glass. So everything technically was perfect, but you know how Hawaii gets very cold in the evening, it gets, I mean, it gets very hot in the evening, it gets quite cool. So there is loud popping noise, you know, when the, when the aluminum expands, but the glass does not. So it scared the hell out of the residents when they first found out about it. You know, it's like a cannon goes off. The people that have never experienced it, you will know what it is. But, you know, you can imagine people in Hawaii used to live in three or four story building and they go into a 50 story building and all of a sudden they hear these loud banging noise and they couldn't figure out. And of course it's sure. It's like our nine o'clock gun. Yeah, but then it's it's hard to control. Even with the specialists that we have, we have lots of experience dealing with curtain wall, dealing with different climates. Little accidents like that still happen. And I like to hear from the experts how we could predict them because it drove the client nuts. Well, you know, and before we talk just on that side, if you talk about the glass aspect, and you know, one of the things we covered here was we're here not just to talk about glass, we're here to talk about envelope. And uh, you look at the jewelry that's on the buildings, you look at the eyebrows, you look at the size of the podium products, stone being incorporated, all these things. So once we get into design assist, uh, quickly just talk about glass. You know, when do we come in, how do we come in? Because performance is driving so much of design, it's almost design becomes secondary to meeting performance requirements. 
Sure, sure. Yeah, the, the earlier in the process the team can get together and look at all the uh, basic design considerations, uh, the better that things will turn out. So exactly what you were saying, Doug, uh, the sooner that we can look at every, everything that's implied by the design in terms of its structural performance, thermal stresses, uh, acoustic performance, if that's applicable, uh, the overall body of design considerations, and especially scrutinize the design relative to everything that's been done in the past. If we have, say, a five foot wide module that's seven feet tall, a double thin unit with no lamination, there's a lot of experience out there in terms of the performance, so we don't need to in investigate that in the same level of detail as if we are dealing with a triple thin glazing unit that's larger, uh, that has jumbo panels on it, that has bed glazing, lamination. Every one, of, every one of these risk factors introduces a level of discomfort relative to the previous body of experience. Uh, so it's not discomfort that means we can't do something new in the future, uh, but we need to understand what the risks are, make sure the analysis is conducted, and the risk is appropriately limited, and that safety is assured, and that all this is dealt with at the design stage, uh, because if there isn't coordination up front, there will be coordination down the road to resolve the issue, it won't be avoided. Uh, so it's best to do that up front and to prevent the issues as much as possible. So that speaks to that. But things we're seeing in design change right now is, uh, it used to be the talk as little as five, 10 years ago, everything's six mil, quarter inch, low E. Now there's rarely a tower that we don't see that's five sixteenths, eight mil, ten mil. We're now even being asked to do twelve mil coated heat strength. So when you get into large, so the question becomes, can you even and, and the experts are here that put our new first in, what does it take and how much how large like you go to go heat strength and on twelve mil coated low E? Right? So on that side of it, uh, you must be seeing a lot more in terms of those complex glass makeups. Then you go triple. Uh, we're talking to Jim on one right now, it's a 3,300 pound sealed unit without a frame. And that building's got to hold that up. So we're going heavier also due to wind loads and codes and so forth. I'm not sure if you've got a comment in that regard. Yeah, yeah. If we, if we look at a triple beam glazing unit and we're dealing with jumbo panels uh, and we want to maximize the energy performance, we might, might want, want to consider putting a lowy coating on the number two surface and on the number four surface, for instance. If we're looking at something like that, then the implication is that this middle pane that can't vent as easily as the outer pane and the inner pane, this middle pane is going to heat up, so that's going to elevate the thermal loading on that middle pane. It's also going to introduce a thermal gradient on the edge seals, because the edge seals in a double pane unit are exposed to two lights that each can vent to their respective air spaces. In a triple pane glazing unit, these seals are now bridging a light that can vent and a light that can't vent. So that's a different thermal loading condition on the seals. And I'm curious uh, what your thoughts are in terms of the, the implications of that. So I know that when you have the, uh, uh, the edge seals, and, and typically in, in this world that we're talking about, we're mostly using silicone edge seals with polyisobutylene as, as the primary seal. Uh, you're fortunate because of the fact that the silicone is affected by the temperature, but it's going to make sure Put, uh, put stresses on, uh, on the PIB. And when you really run the, the thermal models in, in different conditions with different types of uh, airflow and, and uh, boundary conditions on the outside uh, and, and the inside, you, you have to really study what the temperatures are. And, and the temperatures that uh, we'll be able to model, which are done typically in the NFRC uh, software of a thermal window, really need to be studied and, and challenged by all the parties and say, okay, are all these conditions going to be right? And then you have to look at, all right, here's my edge. What happens when I have shading and I've got this large piece of glass and it's in a corner and I'm towards the winter solstice and my, my sun is coming up, uh, you know, low in the sky in the south. Am I going to create such a differential heat in the middle compared to the edge seals that I could cause some unacceptable thermal stress or breakage. What we're seeing with that also is the double low encoding where we're putting on the inboard, call it a double, so a number four surface or a triple number six surface. We're actually seeing now, depending on which low E's may be used, if it's a pyrolytic, for 15 minutes a day, we've seen that there's a first hazing that occurs with this outer load. So as you're designing, Jim, and all our architects are designed, how do you take this into account? You know, it's, it's different at times of year, different locations, different elevations, right? So on the design assist side, it's like the experiences within the industry, it's not with yourself, nor should it be. So as we see design, we can start to talk to 
what levels of loading, what levels of thread, and things like that. So the heat buildups do create cur uh, currents. I, I think in the industry, I don't know about the technical side, but on the design side, I think a lot of design firms actually share our experience and expertise because we do talk to each other. We, we just pick up the phone and say, hey, you did this, what happened? Are you happy with it? You know, for example, um, some of you may know what is called a shadow box, where you put a piece of glass in front of that. But when they first started doing that, it was a lot of hot air that's trapped in that shadow box, and sometimes it pops the glass out, right? So when one firm tells another firm, then we start to look into it, and we try to find, hire the same consultants who have experience, because it's big risks, right? One of these buildings are hundreds of millions of dollars. So we can't afford to make too many mistakes. So I, I think there, there is that sort of camaraderie within the high-rise architectural firms. Like not many of us in the world get to do a 1,200 foot tower. So if you want to find out what happens with glass and building at that height, you have to talk to the people that actually designed them and actually built them. And fortunately, they're very good at sharing their insights. And, and there are conventions that you can go to that you can listen to Adrian Smith talking about the Burj Dubai building, the construction, the glass, the whole skin. And then you know, then you can talk to them about design as well. So that's I think is also very important. So Jim, coming back to the design assist as a looking forward to where the market's going, where from an architectural standpoint, where can we be of greater assistance? Where are concerns? You know, we spoke before stone application, um, eyebrows, uh, jewelry on buildings. So just large format extrusion and so forth. Where do you see those concerns and, and how can we as a whole be of more assistance uh, early on? I think the idea of everybody getting together is a great one because sometimes people forget. You talk about eyebrows and stuff and often a lot of people forget window washing. You know, how do you wash a thousand foot tower that has stone or fins or this and that on it? So we, as a firm, tend to bring people in right early. We'll bring Tractel or somebody in and say, hey, we're thinking about a building like this. We're going to have these kinds of projections. And, and nowadays, you see buildings that are like the Vancouver House that's bending over. So the traditional old platform doesn't work because they come straight down, right? So how do you get those guys to, to attend to or changing glass into things like that? So we all have to come up with new system of allowing people to service the windows and to service all the attachments. So it is a constantly evolving world and that's why communication is important because we would call up big and say, hey, how, you, how did you do that? Or they would call us up and say, how did you do that? So we just share. That's, uh, that's, that's wonderful hearing that because it's just uh, learn as we go, right? So, so I, I've got a comment there because you mentioned about getting together. There's a, there's a number of uh, international forums, especially in the glass business, that, that work on this. That uh, We see glass performance days every other year. We're now seeing glass kind of global facade tectonics. Garibaldi glass day. Garibaldi glass day. Now, yes, I, I know I've seen some of these people uh, internationally at, at these places, but you, you get uh, these forums that have hundreds of uh, presentations, and they also deliver white papers. And, and the white papers are all collected, and, and you can search on them very easily. How would you find them? Oh, the internet. I mean, these are, are not unknown places, but uh, the, the point I wanted to make is like, when you're doing design assist, and you're doing research, and you're doing collaborations, write it up and present it so that other people can then use it. It's not a competitive disadvantage, it's something that really helps the industry. That's actually a great statement, and I think Russ mentioned earlier, I, I believe you've done about 30 papers, uh, right? So I don't know if there's a format, but it, it wasn't as prevalent as it, 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 10, 50, I don't believe it was as prevalent 15 years ago as it is today. I think the complexity is just getting such that we're pushing boundaries. So getting that information out there, it's so easy to find things on that. So absolute, um, I just don't, I guess, my question back to that would be, how to format it so that it's relevant correct rather than just more stuff on the net. Well, it was uh, one time um, an architect from SOM called me about cold bending. 
and I got on my soapbox and, you know, pointing my finger, you architects, you don't know what you're talking about here. And, and Jim, you said back? And, and yes, the architect said, yes, I understand, help me with that. And I said, okay, how about a collaborative effort? You know, and he said, well, we've been working with Hermes to Lisa, we've been working with other glass processors, and so let's just do it. And then calling up people and say, hey, can you donate your time and treasure to a collaborative effort that we will put together a mock-up, we'll test it, we'll write it up, and we'll present it on this date in the future. So we've got a deliverable to deliver. And, and, it, and it worked out because the uh, amount of engineering and modeling that came out of uh, SOM, for instance, for that particular project, none of us could have paid for. The amount of, of engineering and modeling that and or, or the cost, the expertise, yeah. the tentacles of expertise do not reside under one roof. Right. And so what we did, four of us could never have done individually. And then by getting together and doing it, it was a lot of fun. And we pulled a five foot by ten foot piece of glass out of plane eighteen inches before it broke. And and to, to videotape that and record it. And you know, we're all worried about pulling a piece of glass out of plane ten millimeters. It's like, hey, let's go all the way to the cliff. And, and and you learn that kind of stuff and you develop relationships and you put it out there. So things that you do locally in your own facility with your local architects and, and suppliers, getting a group of people together to say, do this and have someone just kind of lead the project, and you'd be surprised, people actually respond and deliver their uh, their work on time for the greater good of the group. So I think the takeaway on that is, uh, it's, this isn't just directed to the architects. We, within our own community here, Garibaldi does it all the time. We're being asked things. There's such a wealth of information out there as we manufacture, we don't just build what we're asked to build. We better be damn sure we can do it, and it's for longevity. Uh, going back 20 years ago, and I'm going to take us to the next one, which is code compliance, performance, and structural. So uh, going back about 20 years ago, I did a presentation at Architects of Hawaii, and I brought a, a sample sealed unit in, and I literally almost got laughed out of the room. Do you know where you are? What do we need a sealed unit here for? Well, look where we are now. So uh, as things keep evolving, we're certainly seeing it now. I mean, I just had that conversation with Otto earlier today, and, you know, there's probably not far off that the towers in Vancouver are probably going to be close to 100% triple glazed at the current state. Where does that stop? And your code compliance, you know, as Garibaldi's shipping product down to Arizona, California, Hawaii, and vice versa, Alaska, on the code compliance, where are we going? Are we going to see triples in places like California? I'm going to be honest here. One of the things I sometimes look at is they run the performance data. I think for numbers on paper opposed to is it required and necessary within a community? And that concerns me. I mean, hey, I'm selling square footage of glass, it's great, but where do we see that and passive house and net zero going? What, where's our future on that side? What do we have to be ready at? Because a fabricator like ourselves spends millions of dollars on the equipment we have. We need to be relevant five and eight years out on the equipment we buy today, all right? So, where are we moving and what do we as a fabricator have to think about what is net zero, passive, uh, triples, communities, regions? I open it up to anyone. Anyway. Sure, yeah, th those are great questions. Um, I'm based in California and Title 24 is becoming much more stringent. Uh, the state originally wanted net zero residential construction by 2020, two years from now. Uh, they aren't going to be entirely there, but they're not going to be far off either. Commercial red Commercial net zero construction by 2030, meaning all commercial buildings by 2030 should consume no net energy. All the energy should be supplied by on-site on generators. So that's revolutionary in terms of the architectural design. And we need to be, in the same way that we're describing the coordination involved on an individual, individual project, you could argue that the coordination involved in developing codes is that much more crucial because that's impacting all of the projects. So if we have code officials who are uh, similar to conversations we were having earlier today, if the, if the code officials are necessitating sourcing of supplies in a way that's not cost effective, that's requiring uh, sourcing from other geographies, you know, that has huge implications. With Title 24, uh, there are two, two compliance paths, the prescriptive path and the performance path. Prescriptive, you specify the components. Performance path, you essentially provide a building that achieves the overall objectives through a more creative method. method. 
So if you want blazing flexibility, you would use the performance path. Right now, the code is becoming much more stringent in terms of the non-blazing elements. So the flexibility of using your preferred blazing type is no longer as readily available because you can't effectively trade off with the, the other building elements. So even the, though the code isn't as directly stating it, the code is appears to be uh, putting pressure on the window to wall area ratio. So if we aren't recognizing that and not addressing it, uh, it's going to have severe implications. So it's very crucial that you know, the overall industry, not just the project teams, but the overall industry, coordinate on the codes, their intent, their implications to all the parties involved, and, and really navigate the process from that perspective. So Jim, that's a good question. So it's war of the wall. You know, how do we keep a bigger visual aspect to a wall? Um, to do that, what are some of the other attributes of the building that will do to be an offset that will keep our glass larger? Well, I, I think the technology is one part, but I think the hidden elephant in the room are the regulators. They have more, as you have said, they have more impact on our industry than anyone else. Because all it takes is one guy at City Hall to say Vancouver will be at a certain net zero in 2020, 2025, whatever, and all of a sudden, another, the junior staff will say, oh, well, to do that, we'll just do passive house. And they'll just arbitrarily mandate that to us. We're already gone through that with the leaky condo situation where a lot of the vapor barriers and stuff was done in Winnipeg, done to certain conditions, not for BC. And as a result, we got lots of problems. So we do have a lot of well-meaning people with half knowledge that's legislating our lives and is making our building extremely expensive and not effective. You know, and I, I can give you an example. We were doing some work in southern China, in, in Hainan, which is like Hawaii. And of course, China is a developing country, so they want to look modern. So what's modern to them is to have air conditioning, right? So they will build these big glass boxes and then fill it with air conditioners. So when we went there and said, no, you should just harness the trade winds and you can do passive, you can do things, they just look at you like, we're not going back. That's what my grandparents used to do. You know, so there is a lot of education, I think, that's part of us that have to spread out to the, to the world. That, uh, that actually made me think of one thing really uh, here that we see, I see more in Europe than I do in North America, which is double skin application. And I'm seeing on existing buildings where they're going in and remodding uh, with double skin. Where do you see the double skins going in North America? And are those IG, IG? Uh, what, where do we see double skins? It's, a, it's very popular in Europe. Is the same thing going to occur here? Is it occurring now? We as a company have an objective to, let's say, educate uh, as much as possible you know, around the world in each region. It, it is very popular in Europe. If you go back 15, 20 years ago, we did the first double skin facade. Now we're talking about closed cavity facades. What is a that? Lot of it. What, what is that? Basically, you've got a facade that's that's self-containing. It's, it's completely enclosed. Its energy performance exceeds, you know, what we can do with a conventional pressure equalized system. Um, you've got maintenance concerns. If you have a closed cavity facade, are you going to integrate the blinds? Line's going to perform. Are you going to maintain the system? Uh, on that, uh, the Stanford Hospital. Yeah. That cavity there is dry air pushed in 24/7, uh, forever more, yeah. to create that inner cavity. There's an IG, and then about a six-inch cavity. Yeah. And there's several methods. Um, we complete uh, PNC Tower a while ago, which is a double wall system with Gensler. Um, I think maybe to some of the earlier comments, another factor to consider besides the regulations and where is it going to go is I think a lot of the, the carbon wall technology and what we've done has kind of gone west you know, from Europe and it's also gone south. If I look back 30 years ago, we didn't do pressure equalized carbon wall. We learned from Canada, you know, and it moved south and then it became a standard. Um, we completed two buildings in Miami recently where very high performance insulating glass. That was New York architects, New York owners. So the developers even can have a factor. They can sell it and they're willing to pay for it. You know, the concern I have, sorry, I'm going to jump in on that. Jim, and, I, and this is a direct question, is, and I hope it's not an unfair question. I, I'm starting to see it now, but I think when I go to certain regions, the developers are more willing to spend the money up front for the longevity of the building than in some of the cities we currently 
<laughs> uh, very close to us right here. <laughs> so it's looking at those challenges you in a big way because it, it, it compromises what you might be thinking, it compromises what we may have. I just want to add one more thing to what you say. The, one of the reasons that the double wall uh, system that is not popular in Vancouver is strictly because of our zoning bylaw. We have a limitation on the floor plate sizes in Vancouver. Residential is 6,500 6, square feet plus whatever. So if we do a double wall, you add at least around three feet. So the city say, no, I have to count that three feet. But if, so, you, if you do that, can you not get some favor for getting more closer to net zero or passive? Not yet. So that's why the regulators is limiting us in terms of implementing the latest technology and being innovative. Because no developer would want to waste a year to negotiate with City Hall to get that exemption. They, the city was progressive when they wanted thicker insulation. They will say, okay, I'll let you count, not count the thickness of the insulation but we have never been successful with the double wall. You know, they'll say, oh, it's too bulky, we don't want that. That means you get another three feet all around the building or you have all that space. So as a result, even though we know that it's a better system and it's also more adoptable, right? Because the good ones, you have an outer skin and the inner skin could be operable. So you could close it, lock it tight, or in gentler climate, you open it and let the air go through. So we just haven't been able to get it through City Hall. Okay. Just yeah. quickly, is uh, trying to keep it on time, but you know what? This is no, this is a great one. So let's 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 just see where this is going. Where so, going. who do the regulators rely on? And, and here, this is one of the things that I talked about. Do we have anyone from local universities? Do we have local professors that teach about building science and facade design? We've got people who are attempting to reduce window to wall ratio because all windows are bad, and yet. Who are they? They're the masonry institutes, uh, people who have a financial incentive and the opacity of the law. And so you have to look at, okay, the regulators, how do we influence them? Well, they are influenced by, by universities, and it's good to include some of the uh, uh, professors of uh, civil engineering who may be teaching facade design and building science. So that, that's something here that, that you could do locally to help you with that. But it's also, you, do, go into a little more detail. How are they uh, influenced? So you, they are independent. You and I are each in the business to make money. And uh, a university professor can be viewed as someone independent. And if he can tell the regulator that it's all about energy performance of the facade. And, and you look at this double facade, what, what, what does it, mean for you to do with the um, uh, square footage of, of the plane? What does it have to do with the energy performance of the building? And and someone who can talk at that level without you or I looking at him going, this is going to help my pocketbook. Okay, okay absolutely. Um, there's still, I mean, this is a huge topic all by itself, code compliance. Uh, what are your concerns for this group who is really, uh, as I said earlier, it's the building envelope discussion. It's not about glass, it's the building envelope. Uh, what should we be concerned about going forward or what assistance can we grant uh, to, to offset what you're saying? Some of this stuff with the university, that I get it, we're living in the real world. How do we address this and how do we go forward? What, what concerns, or are there a lot of concerns and are they being addressed more favorably today than they were 10 years ago? I, I think the education route is really the big one. Um, some of you living in Vancouver may remember about 10, 20 years ago, Vancouver was very much into passive solar, two walls and that, and there was a few buildings built, I believe, on either Fourth Avenue or Broadway, where they actually built these demonstration units. And with the Great Bay Concrete Wall facing south behind class, and you're supposed to harness the sun's energy, and regulate the temperature, and most of those turned into be a flop because they didn't take into the human condition. You know, like people like to see out. If you get this great big wall, you know, you do that. Now, with the passive houses, is also another problem. Let's say you reduce the window area so people need light to read, to live. So you turn on electricity to burn light bulbs. 
So is that actually, so nobody's actually doing a comprehensive energy study as to the benefit of one versus the other. And that's why I think it, the university is a great place. And I think the industry should support industry, uh, in university research. And then they can then influence the government. Because, you know, really, we are vested parties, so they don't listen to us, right? But they will listen to university. I, I think that is a fantastic comment, Mr. Major. They're always looking at one side of the equation, right? And unless we look at the overall, uh, how we're going to deal with that. So I'm not sure if anybody's got something on their mind in retaliation or uh, or 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 in support of. But what can we do to get this window wall or a skirt wall? To a larger fixation on the outside wall. What, what what can we do to make this a stronger resource? Well, well um, ASTM task groups. Uh, a, a situation I encounter frequently is that a task group wants to introduce something new into a standard. They have a lot of ideas that they want to uh, bring forward, uh, but it's complicated to get the research funding to validate the proposals that they're addressing. So either those could be addressed by virtue of prescriptive language, or they could be postponed. But it's it's challenging to get research funding. Uh, so, yeah, th this idea of tying into universities makes makes a lot of sense. I mean, people talk about the cost of education and so forth. Um, yeah, go ahead, Adam. I was going to say, what, uh, what role does LEED and those types of things uh, play in this whole code development? Did you catch that? What does LEED, the role of LEED, play in this development? Well, I, I think LEED represents an interest in sustainability, and it presents a set of criteria that that outline a, a way of validating the, that a project has sustainability attributes to it. Uh, so it's a reflective, of, reflective of the needs involved in, in sustainability. Um, and it has pros and cons, as any program would. Uh, but in terms of coordinating to resolve these complicated issues and, and to put together the research, which costs money, and, and we don't know what the output is until, until it's generated, uh, the universities would be a, a great source for that. You know, there's a lot of criticisms of universities in terms of the, the cost of education, but you know, if you really look at all the all the parties involved, uh, if a university stakes its name in terms of its involvement in these types of studies and finances them and is affiliated with research rather than sports teams and marketing, I mean, that that's really where the, the overall approach would be most optimized. So yeah, the more that we can draw in folks in, from universities to ASTM task groups and, and support them with our backgrounds and knowledge, help them to get their feet wet in terms of our expertise, and then make an objective decision as to how to navigate, uh, the, the better. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, it seems to me that some of the work that's being done on the biophilic design, where they're attempting to, uh, some of the work being done in uh, biophilic design fields, where they're attempting to quantify the health benefits, increased light, uh, increased view and connection to the environment, and they're taking an engineering approach of actually attempting to quantify it, which can have strong implications for people that value quantification, such as code to code attempts. So I think that attempt to take a more holistic approach to, to a wall and say it has to have light or people will go crazy. Sure, sure. That is actually a very up and coming field. Um, unfortunately, it's very hard to quantify, you know. Um, one of the things that I'm really happy to hear is that you're advocating we move away from prescriptive perf uh, formula rather than um, broad energy cut, uh, performance. Because now we actually push that with the city. We actually rather go do energy modeling than to go to the lead points, to your point. And actually more and more institutions are moving away from the because they recognize LEED is really a checklist. It is not really the best way to make a building perform. You know, on that note, honestly, uh, I think it was my brother who pointed this. I, it's like ISO, in a sense. LEED, ISO. You know, you can build the best concrete life jacket on the planet uh, if you follow ISO. So, again, it's a process of just tracking data, but it's reality really there. Alexander. Do you have something you want to say? Yeah, just uh, to uh, point in, in, in yours, in, as far as engaging research, I mentioned PNC Tower, perfect example. They don't listen to us. 
Um, I think Vera Happel did a study with Ben Kinsler that said we need to do this double wall system because it's going to prove your productivity. So it sounded good. Then they went to Columbia and they had them do the research that there is, in fact, with a greater class area, visionary, that in fact, window to wall ratio and greater worker, worker productivity was dramatically. Well, and they said, oh, okay. Yeah, it was I, like all of a sudden, oh, okay, because Columbia said so. Yeah, I, I, that's the longer route. Uh, we could be cynical, but what we found most effective is actually you could invite the government officials on a tour. If you take them to Germany and have them go through those buildings, all of a sudden they go, oh, yeah, that works. But somehow you just keep telling them articles after article, because they don't listen. But they have to see it and feel it. And feel it. Absolutely, absolutely. That's some excellent thing. So we can sort of tie between these things, and none of these boxes sort of sit, but, and I know they're behind you so you don't see them. Uh, so the next thing that we talked about earlier was capabilities. So as we go with the double skins, we go with the larger windows, we go with the podiums. You know, this is the interesting one to me with, uh, with the towers are, keep that to 10 bucks a square foot, but the podium can be $5,000 a square foot. So, because it's the entry. So it's, 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 a, it's, it's interesting to say the least. But when we talk about capabilities, a couple of things I sort of uh, penned here was manufacturing, things like logistics. Uh, there's a manufacturer in, in Germany now who has the capability of making a single piece of tempered glass at 65 feet long. Uh-oh, <laughs> uh-oh. Uh -oh. Open that can of worms. How do you transport it to well, Germany? And this is it. So if you've got that light and you want to drop it into New York, do you hold it on its end by a helicopter? and drop it into the city, what do, you do, what do you do? So getting it onto a ship, getting it onto a truck, whatever the case is. So when we talk about capabilities, you know, the new furnace we put in, 130 by 258. We have a light of glass on the floor that I don't think you've seen here. 130 by 197. We ran it, it's there. Great. What do you do with it? How do you move it around? What are the, the, the big things? I'm not sure if Roland's in the room. Roland? No. Okay. Uh, well, we are talking about standards. Standards for oversized jumbo glass now. You know, what, it, it's a big question. What do you do with that? It, your sight lines, your iridescence, your roller weight. Um, I like to just sort of open it up, but where are we going with those issues and where are the concerns on a capability standpoint when it comes to design? That, that's a good question. Uh, the capabilities will be the, the first question. What, what is feasible? Uh, what are the parameters of the individual members of the supply chain, uh, but then more importantly, what are the implications? Uh, even if it can be done, should it be done? What are the risk factors? Uh, you, you want to think through all these scenarios that occur, not just when the building opens, not just within the first year, but you know, seven years down the road, 20 years down the road. What exactly are we going to be dealing with? If this jumbo unit at the ground level needs replacement, what's the cost going to be? What's the publicity impact of that? If there's a political implication to the building and vandals start throwing stones at it, you know, could somebody just keep taxing this building $100,000 to keep replacing this glazing unit? You, know, you want to think they're all the really odd scenarios that can occur over the project life cycle. Is the glazing composition going to be feasible based upon being right on the envelope of all these capabilities you know, a number of years down the road? Uh, so, so capabilities are the first question. Make sure that everything is locked down from that perspective, but then make sure that all of the implications, the secondary, third, fourth consequences, are all thought through as well. They'll, they'll need to be thought through sooner or later. Sooner is always preferable. Well, it goes a step further. So it's great on design, but it's really, it's, it, it's the whole supply chain. Sure. So great, we've got a big furnace. Current state, there's a glass made in North America in low E to feed that furnace. Okay. It's not far around the corner. You know, we're talking months away. Sure. But uh, as we design, um, I'm not sure what the tallest you've had here, but I think you're close to 300 inches on podium glass vertical standing. So if now with the codes we have to go with the low E, where are we going with low E? How, how large are we going to see in the future? What, what, what's going to happen? And as, as you do that, you're going to have to go with thicker glass also. Yeah, yeah, the glass needs to become thicker. Um, in terms of coating glass, in, in theory, if you have a coater that's wide enough, uh, then the question is, you know, how, how long can you make the glass? And that becomes a question but of... The, uh, but the lear end is only 130 that I'm aware of, right? Well... In theory, the, the coder is very long, so he, he, 
in theory, you could run a long shoot of mess all the way through the coder songs that's available off the, off the main line. To a maximum of one through. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'll, I'll put it another thought because I think our industry always have visionaries that pushes us, not just technology, but their vision. Okay, I'll use an example of Steve Jobs at Apple Store. The first glass Apple Store he did, one of the first one was in New York on Fifth Avenue, the plaza. Okay, um, the architect that did it is a friend of mine, and he was telling me in those days. They all thought he was nuts. Because glass wasn't capable of structural glass to span that kind of distance and do that. But he refused to accept it. He went to Germany, got special engineers, special glass people, and he built it. Alright? And that was at one time. Now I would believe how long, how long ago was that? That was not that long. Uh, Twenty some years ago. Okay? Now, a few years well, before C died, he found out that glass technology has improved. And he ripped out the Apple store there and put in bigger glass, larger span, because he can do it, right? Because he sees a value of doing that to enhance his Apple image. So we have people like that that's constantly pushing the envelope, and the rest of us can follow, right? So that's kind of interesting too. It's not we have one practical side that has to meet the dollars and cents of the bean counters, but we're also fortunate to have visionary corporate leaders who is willing to go for a vision. And then he forces people to make it happen. So on that note, I was reading an article uh, not so long ago that everything's bigger, bigger, bigger. Now it's thinner, thinner, thinner. So now we're talking about them creating glass that's like at least 1.5 mil that they can hand flex. So we're talking about uh, uh, coal bin. Well, pretty easy to do. But how do you get the consistency and the quality and, and the tensile strength? So do we see things going to thinner glass so that we can deal with some of this design for weight reduction and, and so on? I think before we do that, we'll have to address issues like acoustics. Because right now, when you want uh, an acoustic facade, we've got some acoustic type inner layers that get in there. But, but the basics for acoustics is mass. So the thicker the system, the heavier the system, the better the acoustics are. So if I'm going to thin down glass for weight, I've got to find a way how all of a sudden this isn't going to be a, a noise container. Um, and so I think there'll be some technology that has to come there uh, with through advanced inner layer type technology for the acoustics. It's, all, it's a good thing with thinner glass, but remember we have the human factor that if I'm standing next to a great big glass wall and, and we've got a thunderstorm coming through and, and the glass is flexing plus or minus an inch, you, you get personally disturbed. So the glass has to be, be rigid. So just thinning it down for the weight goes against uh, a couple of, uh, of human uh, emotional aspects that I don't think is in our current lifetime. Uh, the thing I'm hearing with at the same time, I just want to throw this back, is thinner glass, SGP interlay lamination. So now you're dealing with a smaller cavity because some of this laminate that we're putting in vertical glazing is so damn thick, so damn heavy, uh, this SGP is a phenomenal product, right, from a, from a strength standpoint. So is that maybe a different version of going to thinner, so we're dealing with less weight on a tower, less concrete weight, less rebar, less everything associated. But, but I don't think it's going to change a tremendous amount. Now, I know we've got some, some folks from Carrara here, but I think when you, you think about annealed glass as a strength of one, heat strength of two, and tempered four, and, and if I'm going to do laminated glass with PBB, that might have a strength of 0 0.75, or SGP might have a strength of 1.1. So it, it's going to be better, but it isn't the step change. So if I've got you know tempered an SGP, that then I can thin it down, but it's not going to like take uh, you know 19 millimeter glass and, and have some sort of equivalency down at you know eight millimeters. I'd like to throw in another thing for discussion. Um, because there's a lot of technology change, um, happening with glass, I forgot the name, 
have some of you, people are familiar with glass that actually change color according to light? Dynam dynam dynamic dynamic glass? Yes, and now there's a lot of people experimenting, laminating TV screens with glass and actually have the building skin be becoming an advertising tool. So I, you know, some of that's already happening. And I think Nancy Chu's here, she tried doing some art with glass, with things laminated in it so that you know, the wing that actually moves and stuff like that. So I see there's a whole other aspect of glass rather than just this envelope, but it's also now dealing with technology, dealing with being creative, perf dynamic performing piece. So it's not static anymore. Yeah, I think that's something, um, you know, uh, I'm gonna go into the capabilities a little bit more as we talk about the same thing. We spent a lot of time last few, a few days just on tensile strength and so forth. As you're doing some of these larger lights too, your sight line now is getting larger of uh, the silicone. I've heard of a product out there that perhaps is a different silicone coming in the future, or maybe it's not silicone, that maybe has a different strength that now your sight line needn't go so large. Where do we see things going, and is there any getting away from having a larger silicone on, on, on an edge of monolithic or even a product? It comes down to the uh, physical properties of these materials. And when we look at the, uh, the silicone materials today um, as adhesives speaking, they're, they're relatively low modulus and low strength. And when you look at the silicone materials that you might experience uh, as, uh, for instance, setting blocks and, and gaskets, those materials have a significant uh, higher uh, tensile strength than, than the wet applied things that, that you put around the perimeter of the IG units. So when the, uh, the technology comes that you can get a wet applied silicone that will have that uh, tensile strength similar to the heat cured products, then you've got the reality of making an impact. Right now, just by taking an, are, are we getting closer to that? Right now what you have is uh, people are able to put in some, some other reinforcing fillers to get some increase in strength of these materials but they're increasing in strength by 10%, not, not an order of magnitude. And so while we're making little incremental uh, points there, uh, there's room to have the, uh, the ability to, to make, a, make a step change because it exists with heat curing, not just the room temperature curing. So stay tuned, especially if that's a need, you've got to voice that. Is that something Jim can rely on that give consideration to in the years ahead, not too far out in the distant future? I, I think it, it's uh, it's feasible, um, much more so than, than, than some of the other things that we uh, talk about. So on that, on the capability side, you know, we're talking a lot about glass, and this is this is envelope, as I said. On the capability side, we're talking about large glass. Things like that. What, what's going on with the aluminum, the walls, the dyes required? Things like that. So, you know, and then I think this would be of great interest to you too because getting some of these super large dyes, super thick walls, uh, paint finishes, things like that. What, what, what are your challenges right now? That's that's a huge challenge, Eric. Um, maybe adding to your answer to your question uh, to what Larry said as well. There's a small chip change that we've made when we look at changing the joint geometry. So if we can narrow the sight line by maybe going to a trapezoidal joint design, something like that. Because it's all about every inch we can give the architect for your vision is better. But then when we do that, now we're increasing maybe the mullion depth and the amount of loom. If we can increase it. Distortion. That. Yeah. And it's huge. You Sorry, Jim, what was it? Distortion. Yeah. And then how are we going to fabricate it? To do that properly, you know, we build our curtain wall like I guess most people would, you know, horizontally. You know, we shoot the structural ceiling from the top side. So now we got to figure out the trapezoid's got to be on the inside. Do we do it upside down? Do we flip it up? So we got to change the entire production process. But we're willing to do that. Going to your comment about paints and aluminum finishes, um, there's tremendous change there. You know, if you look at, uh, you know, we can't use BPDF paint in Europe. You know, liquid applied. Um, we see a, a growing increase in polyester. Uh, due to the metals. 
and, and VFCs from cure. We have the same thing with, sorry to throw in, but the ceramic thread. You can't get bright colors in ceramic thread because of the yeah. metal content. Yeah, yeah. So that's a continuing change. So, you know, when we talk about incorporating color and, and bringing that, you know, realizing that vision, we have to address the regulations that are going on in that industry and they test it. Recently, we just looked at the fact that uh, when you do a uh, uh, Aladine conversion coating in the U.S., fine, that's a good substrate. Well, we found in Europe now we can no longer use chromate in the, uh, the pre-step process. So what do we do? Do we put an anodized glazing strip in everything that we do? So there's constant detail changes that are occurring that I think, uh, to your point earlier, the regulations affect every aspect of the industry. Well, sometimes <coughs> I think we may be too fixated on technology. Because yeah. sometimes if you go back and look at the old European before the double wall system, if you go to an old farmhouse, okay, they would have one window on the inside. Yeah. And then there's an airspace, and then they have an outer window, and then they use it to open and close and control the climate. Yeah. And when I'm listening to you talk about the thick glass, that's one thing. But maybe what I don't know there's any value in thinking of a double glass system that is like the European way, but not three feet in between, but there is like a six inch. But it is actually, you can modulate it and it's much lighter and it'll give you the energy coefficient that like a thicker unit. So I, I think there are ways we should investigate. I think for us as designers is to actually go back to first principles. What is the first principle for energy performance? and not always just chasing the technology of how many coding we put on it, how many of this. I mean, that's part of it, but there may be some innovative way to use the first principle and come up with an effective way of improving the glass performance without just going to thick glass. To, uh, also, to your point, I was going to mention, uh, when you look at the uh, uh, the constraints on aluminum, you know, when we go to, we just completed an embassy job with an architect, Friends of Yours, where we had four and a half inch insulating glass units. So how do you handle it? Because the, the desire of the architect... Due to ballistic and so forth? Yeah. yeah. So the embassy was... Just, just for fun. What was that makeup? Just for fun. Oh, gosh. That was uh, nine layer, you know, laminated insulating glass. So, you know, how, how... One of the first questions that came up was, well, if we have to replace one, how do we lift it? You know, is it okay to grab the outboard light and have all the stress on the silicone? So the silicone supplier said, you better get it done in 30, seconds, uh, 30 minutes because you know, you're going to cause stress. But going to the aluminum piece, which aluminum extruder, ballistic, when we're doing a four-sided unitized, which has never been done before, you know, for an embassy, for a bomb blast, you know, who's going to be able to extrude consistently a straight and a profile? So it's funny what you said with the lifting. We were able to do it, but it was the first time. It had to be considered. Now it gets easy. Yeah. I think we made much power with Rich on that one, I hope. <laughs> Richer. <laughs> uh, one of the things that's curious to me is a, a, a unitizer that I always hear you have to do all unitizing horizontal, opposed to vertical or on, say, a five degree plane. Uh, and I've only seen it horizontal. To me, floor space, real estate's expensive. Why Why does it have to be horizontal or does it? And what, where, if you do it vertically, if you're unitizing, is there shear that's to be concerned with when you're siliconing in there? What, what are the issues, if any, or am I misunderstanding? No, it's, it's a good question, because we've done it, I think, both ways, depending on the type, but is, Historically, and, and just to throw it, because also I, I watched where that glass just hangs when yeah. sitting on the horizontal. So it's just I want to throw that in also that it, it, it feels backwards to me. Well, I think I think historically we felt that that's the best method because you can actually lift the glass horizontally, lay it into the frame, and you've got equal pressure, you know, on the gaskets. You're placing your setting blocks. It's just an easier way to maneuver, it, and also just for the worker down the production line being able to shoot the structure of silicone and do the, do the weather seal. If you've not yet structurally bonded and you're trying to do it in an A-frame or in a vertical position, you've got more stress on the setting block at that point. It's just more difficult to maneuver the glass to make sure it's sitting 
in the frame properly, you've got the right tolerances, you know, around your entire weather scenario. Anything from a sealant standpoint? Perhaps. As he well, smiles? Well, if somebody actually takes a, a, a unit and, and glazes it vertically, and it's kind of twisted kitty wampus, it doesn't go in the wall. So, it, they're all designed to be able to go together quickly. Unitized curtain wall is about really fast construction on the job site, especially in our Western culture where we have union labor on site. Um, you don't want those guys messing around with having to try and jimmy it in the wall with a bigger hammer. So, you get these things put together um, all in the same way so that they can be field installed. Now, if it, it comes right back to these long, uh, the long spans, do I have uh, uh, sagging? For instance, I got a very big piece of glass and I'm just doing this on a table and the glass is just being supported by the frame, it's sagging in the middle. And I very well may have to uh, support the glass in the middle as I do along the frame. But they all have to be done the same way so that when it gets to the job site, they are aesthetically identical. Otherwise, you know, James starts to complain. Yeah, yeah, and we want to think through the entire process there. Even if we support the glass in the middle, say this is a large unit and we're supporting one of the panes in the middle, the outer pane may still be bent up toward the center. Yeah. So, so it's a very good question, especially in regard to these trouble pane based units. So one of the other things that uh, uh, comes to mind with these really large units that we've talked about Roland, before is uh, what happens to airspace in the future? Because as you're dealing with such a large light and wind load, you're getting that flex of the outboard light and possibly touching the middle. Where are we going with the manufacture of really large sealed units and what concerns might anybody have? Uh, you, you need larger air spaces, so now your cavities, your framing takes a different form. Uh, we've run into it where you got one frame, you got multiple thicknesses of units on one plane. How do you address that? Follow what I'm saying? I think, you know, it really comes down just to the framing design. You know, early on when we know, I mean, even to your point, triple glazing. You know, now we're, we're dealing with a, with a lot deeper space, you know, a lot larger mullion. Uh, if we're designing it early on, we know that that's what the goal is, and that's what the IG makeup is going to be. It can be accommodated. It's new dyes, it's new, it's new testing. There's a project here in Vancouver, uh, Steve, that uh, is asking for the vacuum insulated. Um, perhaps really quickly describe it, and is this something that is actually going to take hold in the market moving forward? Uh, th that's a good question. So vacuum insulating glazing involves taking two pieces of glass, and instead of having an air space between them, or an argon filled space, having a vacuum between them. So as you can imagine, if you have a vacuum between two, two pieces of glass, the atmospheric pressure wants to smash them together. So you need small pillars, almost invisible pillars. What are they made of? Uh, that's a good question. That's still something that's being evaluated in development. Uh, but you have very strong, small pillars on a fairly tight grid that are separating these two panels. So you have two pieces of glass. And in this configuration, you could use potentially a, a, a very small space, because as long as you got the vacuum in that space, it doesn't matter what the depth of that space is. You could have acoustic benefits from that arrangement as well. But the idea is you have two pieces of glass, a vacuum between them. So if you're looking at energy transfer across this space, if you're looking at insulating performance, to cross this vacuum, uh, you need a higher temperature differential. So in other words, there's better insulating performance, uh, sort of a step change in insulating performance with this vacuum glazing configuration, as opposed to a preferred fill gas. So there's a limited benefit with argon, a smaller benefit with krypton, and a big benefit with insulating performance. Uh, in terms of the vacuum approach. And overall thickness. And overall thickness. Um, in terms of development, this has been in development for a long time. It's still in development. Uh, there are substantial efforts in terms of moving it forward. Uh, we don't have a time frame at this stage. Um, but you know, looking out at the industry, uh, sometimes people wonder, are we headed to quadruple paints or quad, quad silver coatings? Right now we have double silver coatings, triple silver coatings. The more silver in the coating stack, the better the light to solar gain ratio. So the better the solar control you can have. So if we add more silver to the coating stack, is that the next approach? And it 
I don't think it is. Uh, there are diminishing returns. So it's, it's an exciting time in the industry. We've been uh, going along a trajectory that's fairly predictable for the last uh, number of years. Uh, but now we're getting to a point where there's a lot of pressure from the codes and just making small changes to the way we've been doing things isn't necessarily going to uh, address the situation. So it's an exciting time with, with uh, quite interesting approaches. From the I want to throw a couple things out there. You guys, your product, I'm, I'm, I'm watching, showing you that the heads are spinning and there's a lot to talk about here. So things that we uh, are seeing more of in waves, and I think it's uh, developer specific who's willing to do that. Things like heat soaking, the requirement for heat soak. Uh, coatings, where are the coatings going from the ceilings? Where, if there's something on that, the coatings, we've gone from single silver to double to triple. Is there a quad? Yeah, I, I, I don't think so. I think the approach is going to be something else. Um, there are diminishing returns, so in theory you could do a quad silver, you could do a quintuple silver, but in terms of the, the cost of processing that, maintaining all these process controls to apply you know, five layers of silver and get a, a, a small benefit, it's probably not justified. So, so then the question is, what is the answer? I think in the interim, uh, these questions about triple paint glazing, putting a coating on the number two and number four, and potentially number six surfaces for insulting performance in combination with solar control. That's that builds upon what's already out there, but that, that only gets us so far. And then you know, we need to look at more advanced technologies. You're talking about video screens, not glazing. I mean, there there are all sorts of interesting technologies that can be implemented, uh, navigating architectural desires, code requirements, and so forth. And I think it's important that you know, as we t as we've talked about, that we're active in shaping the future of the art. The future will happen to us, so we want to have our voices reflected and you know, nothing is set in stone, so if we can shape the direction we want for the conversation to head, it can head in that direction. You know, actually, when you say that, there's something that, that really hits me, <clears throat> and I think, Jimmy, I think you and I have had this conversation before. With some of the technology, the coding products that are out there now, uh, it used to be when you're single silver, everybody wants this perfect sheen on the building, and there's no deviation, no nothing, doesn't matter if you're standing there. This degree or that degree, or whatever. to me, glass is a lie. You and I have talked about that. And with the new coatings, if you're going off angle and things like this, it has to be understood that this glass is moving, it's changing. You got to give something to get something. What are your thoughts around that, Jim? Is there a concern that when off angle something shifts, or Doug, it looks like you were just doing? Sorry, Bob. Yeah, it's okay. Go ahead and answer that question. But I'd like to ask the question. Certainly. I think as Architects, we will respond to whatever the industry has to offer because most designers are trying to always evolve. So a new technology, a new type of glass give us new opportunity to look at building. So maybe if that happened, for example, in curtain wall, um, everybody used to just butt the glass straight up and down the building. Right? And now there are firms like you have that use the fish scale type where the glass actually overlaps and it has different performance qualities and so on, or visual qualities. So I think it's up to the creative people to actually take advantage of whatever type of response you guys come up with. And then maybe something happened. Maybe someday they would design building like a fish scale that every piece of glass is slightly different, just for the effect. Awesome. It's good to hear. Does anything else stand uh, back to the heat soaking question? And so we're seeing it. Um, my belief is there was a cause of concern, and that was elevated. And we're seeing. So, so what are your thoughts around the heat soaking? Is this going to be growing in the marketplace? Oh, sorry. I, sorry oh, no. I don't, should we let him go, or should we knock him off? No, I let, let him go. He was first. Really, you sure? Uh, yeah. question is primarily about the standards that we're using in our specifications for um, the new size of the glass or the new requirements. Uh, are the standards that we are currently using our specs adequate? Uh, or they need to, do they need to uh, be updated significantly and, and evolve? And if so, what can we do to kind of encourage that to happen? Uh, well, encouraging that to happen for standards is, is participate in the in the standards development process. Be and you know ASTM is probably the one that's most relevant governing here. 
But when, when we think about things, um, a lot of the standards get developed after there has been, unfortunately, some catastrophe or somebody has got burned and cost a lot of money. And you, you think about the uh, uh, performance of impact testing or like the STM 1886, you know, large missile and small missile that are used around the Gulf Coast for windborne debris. And, and that's because the insurance companies lost a lot of money in 1992 after Hurricane Andrew. And those standards slowly got developed into performance standards. And in, in the certain things, if, if you think that there are things that are not adequate in the standards, and, and you see a need to change them, you have to participate in the standards bodies. Because if you're not in charge of writing the standards, you're going to be following them. And I, I think that's about all. Anybody else? Yeah, yeah. To answer your question, do the standards need to be updated? Uh, eventually, the answer is yes. The, the question is, how do you get there? Um, it's it's very difficult to get a standard passed uh, without having a, a lot of evidence to back it up that, that what is being proposed is validated scientifically. And so it gets back to the question of research funding. How do you get the, the team together to, to conduct this research? Essentially, how to get the universities involved to curate to be the arbitrators of the, you know, all the parties involved. Uh, so, yeah, yeah, the standards need to be updated to keep current. I mean, imagine you create a basic assembly that's 60, 60 feet long and, and 20 feet wide, and you used ASTM E1300. Well, the, if the standard could even cover that, um, you may not rely upon its results. And it, it, there were a contention that the standard said this, and the glazing panel had a different performance. The standards committee could say, well, the standard was never intended to address that to begin with. It covered uh, a more conventional set of options. So, so the catastrophe could result in the standard being updated. Uh, the more prudent approach would be for everybody to begin to get together in advance and to develop the research, advance the standard first, and then proceed with it afterwards. Okay. Um, I want to keep this uh, on track. We have a few minutes left, and two of the areas we, we were looking at was installation and maintenance. And a few things we put down. I just want to see first off if anybody's got any questions, concerns. Uh, yeah, so, so, uh, Scott, go ahead. Just a question regarding the maintenance of the equipment. Gotcha. To be honest with you, that, I'm not intimately familiar with how they accomplish that because um, I didn't actually do the quality control and the selection. Um, it was an issue um, for some, but uh, we have a glass specialist that I should have. So, unfortunately, I can't answer your question. I can get back to it. Uh, so on the installation side, I'm not sure if there's anything that stands out. You know, one of the things that I always say is build a boat in the basement. You know, what are we developing, what are we designing, what are we building? That how do you unbuild uh, down the road when if there's issue? You know, roof cranes, maintenance cranes, uh, replacements, uh, getting them in the first place, dealing with uh, traffic snarl, weather. Uh, is there a too good an answer to all of that? That's a tough one, but I think that's focused on us. <laughs> I think the one thing you have to, uh, as I mentioned early on, is the devil's in the details. Consider everything. So when we use these new materials, I'll give a good example. Um, we're, we're currently directing a project and we're incorporating um, reactive sink panels, right? They're supposed to oxidize. So those go in first and we're doing glass. Well, somebody forgot our mistake. So don't hesitate. The architect always, you know, what were the lessons learned? Don't hesitate to publish that. Well, we're building this job during the winter, right? And then we find out that they're using the ice and salt, so on the concrete floor, so people can sweat. Well, did you ever see a rainstorm get a concrete floor, cascade itself down, a reactive zinc metal panel, and imagine what that So, <laughs> so that was a costly design. So think through every single detail. I guess we like to take the approach, we have a special group, and I'm sure even much smaller companies, they have an operations guy that thinks, all right, 
this is what you designed, this is what we're building in the plan. How are we going to install this? You know, before we even get to the maintenance, and, and think that it, it's, it's critical. You always, always forget something the first time you do it, and you learn the hard way. Uh, but I will, share that practice. We enforce that team approach because when you work with like pension funds, they own a lot of office buildings, yeah. and they do have a maintenance group that actually look over what we design, strictly with the intent of knowing how they're going to maintain the building, how they're going to replace the blocks. Right. So when we propose carrying new toy, you know, 10 by 14, the first thing those guys said, how the hell am I going to do it? Get the stories in the air. The glass is over 3,000 pounds. So in the end, we wind up only putting the glass up where we can reach from the lower 60 feet or so, so that we're not putting them way up at the top. Because we couldn't get past them. those guys, right? They're the building engineers. They're saying, hey, your, your crane can only the window washing crane can only hold so much. And if you make, put those glass in, sure, you can do it during the installation, but if anything happens, who can get them down or who can put them up? You, uh, you mentioned a, 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 an Apple project earlier. We did a little one at Google Camp. And uh, so, <laughs> yeah, it had small pieces of glass. I think it was 14 and a half by 47 feet long. So you have to have an owner participating in a construction maker, which we were very lucky to have to say, all right, we're going to get the glass here, but how are we going to build that? And then, what happens if somebody breaks it? So we had to design a custom machine that was actually supposed to do that. So it, it really reaches across the industry, you know, small and large. So how big was the glass again? 14, 14 and a half by 45 and 47 feet. Quad lamb. Laminated. 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 3,400 3, sliding doors that size? Yeah. Do you want to do it? We'd love to have a job like that. <laughs> Play with it. But you need one, one sixteenth inch tolerance. And the architect looked at the ceiling joints from three inches away. <laughs> we got people like that. <laughs> well, uh, so you know what this, this actually comes all the way around. We are pretty much, uh, I'm sure you can hear the clanking of bottles. The bar is open. So I just want to wrap up uh, here. But uh, this was some awesome information. One thing I will say is we're going to come full circle in this last little conversation is back to design assist. I think something that Garibaldi really, uh, when we bought this new furnace, this is my soapbox. I was telling you how I can best explain this. We could have bought it with the furnace, but we didn't because this market is moving in direction. Well, if we look at this for the iridescence, we look at it for the roller weight and so forth. You know what, whether you're building a custom residence or a boat, a yacht that we do, or a commercial application, a hospital, damn it, we never get in early enough and we never put our foot down hard enough to things that are untried, untrue, unpracticed, to discuss it. And I love what you said before, Jim, there's people to call. Well, call us, we'll call you, we'll call each other. You know, this, this, this is resource right here. And I think sometimes people are just scared that someone else is gonna step up to the plate and take something. Well, you know what? It's a liability of our businesses online, right? Longevity of the, the ownership is not happening so So the warranty, I think, for me to close on this, I don't think the warranty has been understood well enough for some of the new products that are coming out. Um, I don't think that necessarily some people in all facets of building a tower should necessarily be involved. And if they should, they should be looked at. Including Jim's office, you want to hear from us. If we have concerns, you don't want us to bear our head in sand. You need to hear it. It's your reputation as much as ours. So that's kind of on the work side. I think we have some issues on that when it comes to perhaps oversight of the complex and multi-layered mail, uh, all these things. So I sort of said my bit. I do want to have one close, but I'm just wondering if anybody has a closing statement they wish to make. Uh, anybody from here? I think there's an awful lot of great information. Anybody want to share anything that uh, comes to mind? I think you've summed it up very well. I think it's very important for the project team to coordinate as early as possible uh, to think down the road with the project basis as well as on an overall industry perspective in terms of uh, regulations, code officials, coordinating with educators, uh, thinking through many steps in the process. If anything is theoretically attainable, uh, it's all in the, say all in the details, and we need to address those at some stage. Sooner is better than later, and coordination is the solution to the information.
So on that note, guys, uh, Glass Day is about education and having some fun and seeing what we've got out there so people can see firsthand what it takes for equipment to make the dreams that, that live. So uh, I really want to thank everybody for coming out. Uh, we've got some drinks and food gone until 7 here, and there's also some cars that show where we're going to have an event downtown. Love to see downtown, it's right on the seawall, uh, as we do every year. So to our speakers, uh, you guys have been fabulous. We put something aside for you, which we'll deal with separately. Uh, but thank you very much for taking the time, flying in across the continent for that matter. And Jim, very busy man, thank you so much. So on behalf of all of us, thanks guys. Here in line outside.